Well, mm. Gnung Padang. Yes. I realize that this is an artist's rendition of what it would look like. This is in Indonesia. Yes, Tell but me it's, what based, this is. it's based on the very solid science and archaeological work. Why is there a 20,000 year old pyramid in Indonesia? That's a very good question. The Great Pyramids of Egypt are four and a half thousand years old. The Mayan pyramids are less than 2,000 years old. So, how did Graham Hancock manage to find a 20,000 year old pyramid in Indonesia? In this video, we'll find the answer to that, and you won't believe how he did it. Well, maybe you will if you're familiar with Hancock's body of work. And please mirror this video because it could very soon get blocked. If you're a Graham Hancock fan and you think everyone else should open their minds enough to share his belief, here's a challenge. Will you open your mind enough to watch this video and see what Hancock missed and fabricated in his new Netflix series, Ancient Apocalypse? Can't hurt, can it? There used to be a popular program in the UK called Time Team with actor Tony Robinson, playing the non-scientist, reporting on various archaeological digs around Britain. In one program, they were investigating a geophysical anomaly believed to be an old Roman villa. But the bits of pottery and brick they dug up kept pointing to a medieval monastery instead. That's not what we want to find, said a disappointed Tony. Professor Mick Aston, who supervised the digs, had to patiently explain how archaeology works. What we want to find as archaeologists, he said, is the answer to whatever was here. And if it was a medieval monastery, then we find what we find. And that's the difference between a professional scientist and an enthusiastic amateur. When it comes to answering questions about history, archaeologists want to find whatever is actually there because each piece of evidence, each discovery, however dull or disappointing it may be, fills in another piece of our jigsaw puzzle that starts to give a complete and accurate history of our species. The quest for lost civilizations has been a book and movie favourite for years. In the 1970s, Eric von Daniken promoted the idea that aliens had come to Earth to teach ancient people how to build things, once that fad had passed, Graham Hancock swiped von Tannikin's book titles and the aliens became emissaries from a lost civilization wiped out about 12,000 years ago. Who taught ancient people how to build things? The last thing we want to believe, it seems, is that our ancestors were smart enough to learn for themselves how to build these things over a long period of time. But if outside help is always needed, I wonder how Hancock's imaginary civilization figured it all out on their own. I've spent decades searching for proof of this last civilization. And he's still searching, because after 30 years of touring the world, Hancock still hasn't discovered a single town, or a burial site, or a boat, no writing, not even a garbage dump. Hancock's explanation is that this civilization existed somewhere he doesn't go, like... One of them is the Amazon, another is the Sahara Desert, and then under the continental shelves. And let's not forget buried under the ice of Antarctica, which he proposed in his book Fingerprints of the Gods. But the one thing we know about this imaginary civilization is that they were supposedly experts at building huge pyramids. But despite commercial and private planes flying all over these remote places, plus the advent of Google Earth, no one spotted a single one. Even Hancock hasn't bothered to spend some of the millions he made selling books and TV programs to hire a private plane and look for his lost civilization. The only place on Earth where we know for sure this pyramid-building civilization did exist is in Hancock's head, because he'll be the first one to tell you that this isn't a fact, it's his belief. Which is fine. Where he comes into conflict with reality is where he claims he's found mysteries that support his belief. Hancock's ideas have been laid out in numerous books and TV shows and now a Netflix series, thanks to whoever posted the message alerting me to it. I had intended to go through the whole series and see if I could spot any errors. But no kidding, by the time I got to the end of just the first episode, I found so many fabrications, omissions and misrepresentations that I already had enough to fill this entire video, which turns out to be the longest I've ever made. 
Before we start, you need to understand that as well as copying von Daniken's book titles, Hancock also follows von Daniken's tried and tested modus operandi for leading an unskeptical audience, as we'll see throughout. And rule number one is start by painting professional archaeologists as bumbling, dogmatic, and baffled by whatever they find. Of course, this idea is upsetting to the so-called experts. The extremely defensive, arrogant, and patronizing attitude of mainstream academia, the initial evidence has utterly confounded mainstream archaeologists. Then step in as a persecuted visionary who dares to challenge them with innovative new ideas. The series kicks off at a megalithic site in Indonesia called Gunung Padang, and within a few minutes, Hancock is already softening up his audience with rule number one, portray archaeologists as a bunch of incompetents who wouldn't know a significant site if they tripped over it. For a long while, archaeologists thought it was just another hill in the jungle. But there was a problem with that view. Yes, there was a problem with that view. Hancock made it up. And there's no better evidence for that than Hancock himself. In a speech posted in 2018, Hancock's claim was qualified. For a very long time, it was thought to be just a natural hill. That's all? With an interesting megalithic site on top of it. Ah, yes, just an ordinary hill with a megalithic site on top of it. And in an earlier interview posted in 2016, he said this. For a very long time, people believed that it was just a natural hill with with an old, but not extremely old, megalithic site on top of it. So clearly Hancock knew that his claim in the Netflix film that archaeologists thought this was just another hill was nonsense. He made this up simply because it made archaeologists look stupid and it made him look smart. And there's no excuse for this fabrication either. At first sight, this open terrace could be mistaken for a natural formation of volcanic rock, which is why archaeologists were so slow to investigate it. But archaeologists didn't mistake it for a natural formation, as Hancock well knows. And he also knows they weren't slow to investigate it. Again, we have to go back to other statements Hancock made to show he knew that very well. It's a megalithic site that's been in plain view and was in fact first inspected by archaeologists as early as 1914. Yes, a megalithic site in plain view, not mistaken for a natural formation, and investigated as far back as 1914 when a Dutch archaeologist wrote a report about it. The site was forgotten about during the turmoil of World War II and the bitter war that ended Dutch colonial rule. But when three farmers rediscovered it in 1979, Indonesian archaeologists immediately investigated. Indonesia's National Research Centre of Archaeology issued a report on Gunung Padang in 1985. At that time, Hancock was writing a book about the AIDS epidemic. After the National Research Centre of Archaeology came studies and investigations by archaeologists from Indonesia's Directorate of Antiquities, the National Archaeological Research and Development Institute and the Bandung Archaeological Centre. So ironically, archaeologists took an interest in the site long before Hancock did. If you want to know what archaeologists really think, ask them. Don't get a summary of their investigations and conclusions from the guy whose success depends on discrediting them. They conclude that evidence shows Gunung Padang is an old, extinct volcano into which at least five terraces have been cut near the top, one of which has a retaining wall. Rough enclosures and pavements have been laid out, as well as stairs up to the site, using readily available volcanic columns as building material and it was built around 2,500 years ago. These hexagonal columns form when molten lava comes out of the volcano, cools quickly, shrinks, and creates hexagonal cracks. Even Hancock accepts that. When they weather, they collapse, forming loosely scattered columnar joints. You can see loosely scattered columnar joints not only at Gunung Padang, but also other sites like Detunata Goala in Romania, But unlike Gunung Padang, they haven't been arranged in patterns and no terraces have been cut. There are dozens of megalithic sites in Indonesia, but Gunung Padang is the largest. 
After painting a picture of archaeologists as a bunch of naysaying incompetents, Hancock interviews a geologist called Danny Natawijaja, who, for the purposes of his program, represents the complete opposite. Dr. Danny Hillman Natawijaja studied at Caltech, but now works for Indonesia's Geotechnology Research Center. So, a professional, sober, competent geologist. Absolutely. Da- Danny comes at this as a scientist. His, his interest is that. Which is yeah, good. Someone who's completely impartial and only interested in the science and what his scientific equipment tells him. They did ground penetrating radar, seismic tomography, electrical resistivity. All right, Graham, lots and lots of real and objective science. We get the point. There had been an archaeological team excavating the site since 2011. Then, in 2013, Natawijaja independently started his own investigation using drills and ground-penetrating radar. Hancock describes what happened next. An extraordinary new possibility began to force itself on the researchers. That they might be confronted by the work of a civilization lost to history. But of course, this is a Hancock film, so things are not always as straightforward as the story we're being told. Natawijaja is indeed a geologist, a renowned seismologist, very competent in his own field, and here's one of his books. But he's also been a long-time proponent of the idea that Indonesia is the site of Atlantis. Yes, you heard that right. He's not only promoted the idea in print, he explained it to Graham Hancock in previous interviews as far back as 2014. So the idea of an ancient civilization was hardly forced on Natawijaja. He'd already reached that conclusion long before he started his 2013 investigation. But none of that was mentioned in the Netflix program. Natawijaja never published his findings, so all we can go on is a poster he showed at a meeting of the American Geophysical Union in 2018. It shows that this supposed pyramid is indeed an extinct volcano, a natural hill with terraces cut near the top, just as archaeologists had always said. There's no way for Hancock to get around this embarrassing discovery, unless, of course, he changes the definition of a pyramid, which, of course, he does. There's a question of definitions here. How do we define a pyramid? But if we define it as a structure that rises in a series of terraces to a summit, uh, that's what we're looking at. Well, no, I don't define a pyramid as a series of terraces to a summit in a natural hill. Otherwise, there are pyramids all over East Asia and other parts of Indonesia come to that. Hancock not only redefines a pyramid, but he also scales back his illustrations. Just a few years ago, this was what his pyramid supposedly looked like based on... Based on the very solid science and archaeological work. But in the Netflix film, it's been scaled back. Even with artistic embellishments and a bit of imagination added, it's clearly a natural hill with a megalithic site on top. Even the archaeologist Hancock interviews Ali Akbar, who, by the way, also wants to believe that Indonesia is an ancient civilization, confirms that what we see on the hill, all of this, is a megalithic site about 2,500 years old. And he tells Hancock that. So now comes the job of making the audience believe there must be something inside the hill and watch carefully how he does it. First, we hear Dr. Akbar explain that just below the surface, his team uncovered artefacts dating back to around 7,200 years ago, suggesting that humans had visited the site that far back. And Hancock initially reports this correctly. They quickly found evidence that humans had been present in what's called a cultural layer. That's right, evidence that humans had been present. Hardly surprising in an area where hunter-gatherers would have roamed 7,000 years ago and no doubt occasionally camped on top of the hill. But then Hancock very subtly switches the dates. He turns the humans who were here 7,200 years ago into the builders of a site that he's just been told is about 2,500 years ago. An old, but not extremely old, megalithic site. And the reason no one notices the switch is because he slips it into a question. 7,000 years ago, far from being builders on such an epic scale, there's no evidence that the people of this region were anything other than simple hunter-gatherers. 
What could have motivated them to make the immense effort of bringing all these blocks here? The audience is so busy pondering the question, they don't notice that Hancock has just introduced not one, but two fallacies into the question. The first is that all the blocks were brought here. The second is that it was done 7,000 years ago. I wish I could say that Hancock is a genius at this kind of manipulation, but in fact it's a very old technique. Journalists and salesmen use it all the time. So do advertisers. They don't advertise UK lottery tickets by giving you important and relevant information, like the fact that only about half the money people spend on lottery tickets actually gets returned as prizes, or the fact that your chance of winning the jackpot is around 1 in 45 million. They have to ignore inconvenient facts and instead feed your imagination. And the best way to do that is to ask, what would you do if you won? And even the implicit if you won is either subdued or completely omitted because we have to turn this improbability into something people believe could be real. What would I do if I won Lotto? I'd play 18 holes at Glen Eagles. I'd really love to see the Northern Lights. If I won Lotto, I'd get myself a house with my own pool. Lotto, what would you do? Having given this impression that all these stones were physically carried to the site, Hancock then reinforces it. Every one of these blocks, up to 50,000 of them, and each weighing up to a third of a ton, were carried up this hill. Even the experts Hancock spoke to don't make that claim. Again, the columns are perfectly natural, and they're found scattered naturally at Gunung Padang, just as they are at Detonata Guala and also here at the Devil's Post Pile in California. They're the result of cooling joints, weathering and collapsing. According to a paper published by the University of Geneva, some of the stones had been transported, and they were used for the stairway. They were brought from 300 metres away from the Sakuta River, and others a little further down the valley. Not an impossible feat even for hunter-gatherers, let alone Iron Age people from 500 BC. There are dozens of examples of monuments being built around that time, and even older, not just in Indonesia, but all over Southeast Asia. Sometimes we know exactly how they were moved, because the practice continued until recently. Sometimes we know how they could have been moved. All it takes is organisation, manpower, a few simple tools, and lots of rope. So there's really no mystery in how people from 2,500 years ago could have rearranged columnar joints they found naturally scattered on top of Gunung Padang. And that's the problem for Hancock, because his books and his films depend on a mystery that he steps in to solve. So he has to manufacture one. Now all we need is another manufactured mystery to push the date back even further. And here it is. Natawijaja has found something inside the hill. There's a void. Yes, there's a void. Shouldn't that be accompanied by a dramatic heartbeat? There's a void. That's better. What Dr. Hillman and his team have discovered are at least three large rectangular chambers. One around 10 metres down, perhaps an entrance hall of some kind. It seems to have an access tunnel leading to a larger main chamber. And another passage, connecting to a third chamber. OK, hold the image you've just made in your head, visualising the inside of these large rectangular chambers. I'm guessing it's something like this, right? But look how quickly the programme has taken us on a journey of the mind just by slipping in a few trigger words, from low-velocity zone to void to chamber to a large rectangular chamber to an entrance hall reinforced by an artist's imagination. Boy, you're going to be so disappointed when you see what these chambers actually look like. Here they are. They're just amorphous, low-density anomalies on the tomographic readouts. The reason they show up as different colours is because of the different methods of tomography used. Only one looks vaguely rectangular in two dimensions, at an angle not very conducive to standing upright. The rest are all different shapes and orientations. You can see that better if I outline the areas Natawijaja has identified. These are all the shapes of the voids, though not on the same scale. 
Now, as a geologist, when I hear about voids like this inside a volcano, my first thought is a very common geological feature called a lava tube. The surface cools quicker and forms a solid crust. The river of molten lava underneath pushes its way through, expanding the crust. When the lava has run out, you're left with hollow tubes like this. But Hancock never mentions lava tubes because, again, that doesn't fit the image he's trying to feed you. And any doubts or ambiguities are disguised, like this question mark against the word chamber, which was in Natawi Judge's original poster, but got airbrushed out for the Netflix film. But to historians and the archaeologists who first excavated this site, Dr. Hillman's discovery just doesn't make sense. On the contrary, it makes perfect sense. Volcanoes are exactly where you'd expect to find natural cavities. Once again, this is an example of Hancock manufacturing a mystery, proclaiming that archaeologists have no explanation for the mystery he's made up, and then proceeding to try to solve the made-up mystery himself. So is there anything in this volcano that does point to an ancient civilization? Hancock has only one thing left to try. To put a date on this hill that's not a hill. Hold on, it is a hill, Graham. We've been through this already. You're not going to pretend it isn't a hill, either by redefining the word pyramid or putting the word not into the script. OK, let's continue putting a date on this hill. Oh, and see if you can spot the four trigger words that Hancock slips in here to turn a rather ordinary dating result into yet another mystery. Dr. Hillman and his team turned to another geological tool, core drilling. Going further down, around 100 feet or so, he hit the earliest layer of construction. Let's try and put dates on when this was shaped. Did you spot them? Here they are in caps. Hancock is feeding us cues to imagine columns that have been laid out and constructed and shaped. But where is the evidence for that? All the drill brought up were lumps of soil and pieces of rock. There are no artefacts, no inscriptions, no carvings, no evidence of construction or shaping or anything being laid out. If there was, you can bet Hancock would be proudly showing it off. Danny's findings are utterly extraordinary and bewildering. Well, not really. Natawi Jaja drilled down into a volcanic hill and came up with samples of volcanic rock. It says so in his core log. Read it. Fragments of columnar joints, basaltic andesite rock, and fresh, massive, fractured basaltic andesite rocks, which is as unremarkable as putting a spoon into a trifle and coming up with jello. Not one piece of evidence of human manipulation. Those drill cores were pulling up datable materials that dated way back as far as 24,000 years ago. But what is that datable material? According to Natawi Jaja, who documents the dating results in his poster, it's just natural soil from 10 metres down. And that's hardly a surprise because the further you go down into any soil, the older it is. Notwithstanding leaching and other problems associated with dating soils, if you drill down to a layer of soil that's 24,000 years old anywhere in the world, you'll get organic material that dates to 24,000 years ago. It doesn't mean there's a lost civilization down there. But at least we now know how Hancock came up with the claim, shown at the beginning of his video, that this extinct volcano is a 20,000-year-old pyramid. And it can be done with any megalithic site with terraces. First, define a pyramid as any hill with terraces at the top. Then drill down until you get to soil that's 20,000 years old. And voila, you've manufactured a mystery. Just slip it into a question to divert audience attention. Why is there a 20,000-year-old pyramid in Indonesia? Towards the end of that first episode, Hancock moves to another place where volcanic columns were used in construction at Nan Madol in Micronesia. Archaeologists believe most of the construction visible at Nan Madol today dates to around 900 years ago, when the blocks were quarried at a neighbouring island. But during my explorations on previous visits, I found several of its megalithic pillars extending out below the waterline. 
suggesting that earlier versions may have been constructed when sea levels were lower during the last ice age. Or it suggests that Hancock has rushed to judgment in claiming these are megalithic pillars without bothering to check whether they actually are. But anyway, first, what image do you have in your head, what impression of events, based on Hancock's story? Narrow-minded archaeologists developed a fixed idea about construction based on what they see on land. But then Hancock went underwater and discovered pillars that could be much, much older, thus challenging their dogmatic conclusion. Archaeologist nil, Hancock won, right? OK, perhaps you're having second thoughts about forming that impression, because you know that, of course, I'm now going to blow this bullshit apart. First, Hancock implies that he found the underwater pillars. But in fact, they'd been found about 20 years earlier by an archaeologist called Arthur Sachs from Ohio State University. And another archaeological team in 1988 and 1989 had investigated them further. But neither gets a mention in the Netflix program because that doesn't fit the image of archaeologists as narrow-minded buffoons who never look outside the obvious. It has to be Hancock, the visionary free thinker, who takes the initiative to dive into the water and find these pillars himself. But when he supposedly found these man-made pillars in 1998, Hancock must have already known that they were almost certainly not man-made. They're made of natural coral. Years earlier, a team from the University of Oregon had drilled 20 centimetres into several of the pillars and only found coral. Then they raised one of the pillars to the surface, cut it open and confirmed it was entirely made of coral and therefore entirely natural. But the entire story we're about to hear is dependent on these underwater columns being man-made stone pillars, so Hancock completely ignores the archaeologists' findings. Architects have made it across the South Pacific to Micronesia. Well, those architects lived about 2,500 years ago, so who knows? Of course, Hancock's referring to his imaginary Ice Age civilization that he believes built an imaginary structure inside the volcano 20,000 years ago. Despite having no evidence for their existence, he now has them getting into boats and sailing thousands of miles across the open ocean to raise stones on a remote Pacific island. But if these pillars under the water at Nan Madol are just coral, then there's no man-made construction under the water. And with no man-made construction under the water, then there's no Ice Age civilization there. And with no Ice Age civilization at Nan Madol, then there was no voyage across the Pacific, which means this whole elaborate train of speculation comes crashing down. But anyway, the audience doesn't know any of this, and there's no time to think. They're already focused on the mystery of what happened to this Ice Age civilization. And if so, what happened to them? Having manufactured this phony mystery, Hancock steps in as the only person who can provide an answer. Well, I believe it has something to do with what happened around 12,800 years ago. What happened 12,800 years ago was an event called the Younger Dryas, a period when deglaciation suddenly went into reverse and the Earth rapidly cooled down again. Hancock calls the Younger Dryas a major cataclysm. As the ice sheets advanced, ecosystems changed and some large animals became extinct. And apparently Hancock had predicted all that back in 1995. To me, in 1995, when I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, but there was no compelling evidence for a global cataclysm then. But of course there was compelling evidence back then. The Younger Dryas has been known about for 120 years. Hypotheses for what caused it have varied from the breach of an ice dam, sending trillions of tonnes of cold water into the Atlantic thermohaline circulation, to the hypothesis of a comet impact, a major volcanic eruption, or a shift in the jet stream. Hancock isn't a visionary who predicted this major cataclysm back in 1995. He knew about it because it was in every geology textbook. Hell, even I studied the Younger Dryas as far back as 1975. So let's see what sort of cataclysm Hancock thinks the Younger Dryas produced. First, global temperatures plunge to the level that they were at the peak of the ice age, and they do so 
almost literally overnight. No, they didn't. The Younger Dryas began around 12,850 years ago, and average global temperature fell to its lowest level around 12,700 years ago. That's a period of 150 years. Now you may say, but Hancock doesn't mean literally almost overnight. But yes, he does. Hancock specifically says... Almost literally overnight because you need that image of a sudden plunge in temperature in order to build on what comes next. And secondly, there's a sudden and inexplicable rise in sea level. No, there wasn't. Sea levels have been rising since the end of the glaciation, as oceans warmed and ice melted. It had been going on for 7,000 years before the Younger Dryas, and it continued during the Younger Dryas, and it carried on for 5,000 years after the Younger Dryas. Between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, the oceans of the world rose dramatically in a series of immense deluges. Mm, no, they didn't. But first, what do you imagine now that you've been fed trigger words like dramatically, immense and deluge? Something like this. This is the video Hancock actually shows in the program to back up the words. But forget the images, let's concentrate on the figures. What period of time was that again? Between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. But that's 1,200 years. And how much did sea level rise during that time? The oceans of the world rose dramatically. No, dramatically isn't a number, it's just an image. Hancock doesn't give us a figure for good reason. During the timeline he cites, sea level rose around 17 metres, which is very dramatic, but over a 1,200-year time period, that's about 14 millimetres a year, just over half an inch. This epoch of immense floods would have traumatised all of humanity. Eh, no, it wouldn't. The so-called great dramatically immense traumatising deluge didn't look so much like this as this. If you stood on the beach at high tide during the Younger Dryas, then the immense deluge would probably have reached your ankles after about six years. Even if you double the rate of rise, it would still take three years for the water to reach your ankles. We've had an average global rise in sea level of around 60 millimetres in the last 20 years, so hard to detect without instruments that a lot of people write into the channel saying they don't even believe it's happening. Why would a rise of half an inch a year during the Younger Dryas have been any more traumatising or noticeable than the same rise that had been going on for thousands of years before it and would continue for thousands of years afterwards? Hancock doesn't explain because he doesn't have to. His audience, the kind of people who buy his books, is completely unaware of the rate of sea level rise and he never tells them. He leaves it to trigger words and images to give an impression instead of explaining the facts. To be fair to Hancock, he makes no claim to be looking at the subject impartially. It's not my job to be balanced or objective, he writes. He's just providing a persuasive, single-minded case for the existence of a lost civilization to balance the history books and academics who do nothing but refine existing orthodoxy. But trying to be persuasive doesn't give Hancock the right to fabricate evidence, misrepresent findings, and hide facts that contradict his beliefs. And how is it balancing the history books when most people have never read a history book on Gunung Padang or Nan Madal? All they know about these places is what Hancock tells them. And all they know about the conclusions of archaeologists about these places is what Hancock makes up. Hitherto archaeologists had regarded it as a long-established fact that no large-scale structures were built anywhere in Southeast Asia until around 4,000 years ago. I was curious as to why so many people swallow whatever Hancock tells them without question. Looking at the comments on the video of his Joe Rogan interview, some of his fans are impressed with his eloquent speaking voice, his recall of information. Whether the information is real or made up doesn't seem to occur to them. And praises heaped on interviewers like Joe Rogan for sitting there and letting Hancock unleash all these claims without once critically questioning a single thing he says. It seems like heresy to question it because Hancock's giving his audience what they crave, 
lots and lots of supposed mysteries. A mystery crying out for investigation. There's an intriguing mystery here. We're dealing with truly a mystery here. A mystery that needs to be explained. To all the Hancock fans out there, I do get the appeal. And of course I would love these mysteries to be real and a lost civilization discovered. It would be much more exciting if a cavity in a volcano was an ancient entrance hall rather than just a plain old lava tube. Or if this was part of a man-made construction rather than just a boring old pillar coral. No one's against that. Who doesn't want to find a lost civilization? But for that you need evidence. As Mick Aston said, at the end of the day what professionals want to find is what's actually there. If the only way to support this dream of what amateurs want to find is to fabricate imaginary evidence and ignore real evidence, then sorry, of course no one in the archaeological community is going to take it seriously. So I would love to hear from Hancock fans to see what you think. Please don't just write comments saying my video is bullshit or it's an ad hominem attack against Hancock. I'm not judging his eloquent speaking voice, his intelligence or his personality. I'm happy to agree with all the gushing praise of his personal qualities. What I'm concerned with are the fabrications and the omissions, so please address that. And if you think there really is evidence that Gunung Padang is a 20,000-year-old pyramid, or that these pillars at Nan Madol are man-made, please post it. If you can't do that, and prefer to launch a tirade against my voice or my personality, please do so. I'll take that as an admission you can't find fault with my critique. So having a go at me is the best you can do. It's ironic that Hancock accuses archaeologists of sticking rigidly to orthodox theory, when in fact there have been huge changes in their understanding of our Paleolithic and Neolithic ancestors. New evidence and new discoveries is the way all sciences progress, not through beliefs and wishes, but through hard physical evidence. The image Hancock gives of orthodox archaeological theory that hunter-gatherers suddenly settled down and became farmers and then built cities has long been overturned. Archaeologists discovered decades ago that hunter-gatherer societies were far from simple and the line between hunter-gatherers and settled farmers is blurred. They were often both, and changed from one to the other as circumstances allowed over thousands of years. And far from being simple, they established trading routes, made art, and constructed gathering places and sacred sites. And archaeologists may have discovered the reason for the site at Gunung Parang. A 2008 unpeer-reviewed study by Dalan and Situnkir found that when you strike some of these stones, the ones that are grouped together, they produce notes in harmony with F, G, D, and A. That might have given the site spiritual significance. The authors hypothesized that over many years, people arranged the musical stones to be used as instruments, perhaps for spiritual or ceremonial purposes. It's only a hypothesis, but importantly, it's backed by actual evidence. And to me, reality based on evidence is always far more interesting than a belief based on fabrications. These new discoveries in archaeology weren't dreamed up by flying to famous landmarks around the world and making up stories. They've been made by archaeologists spending years or even decades in hot and dusty places digging up hard evidence out of the ground. By analysing seeds, by tracing DNA by matching pottery and finding real, not imaginary, evidence of construction. And every day, as a result of their efforts, we're learning something new about our past. And not one shred of evidence so far points to even a trace of an Ice Age civilization. So it's not archaeologists who are sticking rigidly to fixed ideas, ironically, it's Hancock, who for 30 years has stuck to his unwavering belief in this imaginary Ice Age civilization. Now, I don't doubt his sincerity, he really does believe it. So much so that he's prepared to make up a host of fabrications to support it and airbrush out anything that contradicts it. My channel doesn't ask for money, and unlike most YouTubers, I don't make these videos for financial gain. 
But since people have frequently asked if they can contribute something, I've suggested they send money to an innovative charity called Health in Harmony. The model has resulted in 70% less deforestation in an important national park, saving over 27 square kilometres of rainforest. The study also found that it's provided cheap medical services for over 28,000 people who would otherwise have been cutting down trees to pay for health care. The model is now being extended from the forests of Borneo to Madagascar and Amazonia, funded in large part by contributions from my subscribers. Details are in the video description, and my thanks to all those who've contributed.